Now, we know that HSBC and other large UK banks have committed fraud. They rigged the interbank interest rate called LIBOR. Deutsche Bank was fined £227 million, Lloyd's 105 million, and so on. We know they've fixed foreign exchange markets, FCA fines totaling 1.1 billion on five banks. And these are all UK. If you go to the US, fines much, much bigger. Slightly more obscure, Barclays rigged something called ISDAFIX. It was fined 70 odd million pounds. And it was also fined 300 million for fixing the energy market in California. These are all frauds. And some of the later ones were perpetrated while the banks were telling the regulator, oh, we've sorted everything out and here's a fine for what we did last time. Now, and although these fines sound large, you know, £100 million is probably a lot of money to anyone in this room, to the banks, they're a bit of an overhead. And typically, after the amount is finally announced, the share price goes up. Some of the individual traders might be prosecuted. I mean, after all, they were caught bang to rights, asking colleagues to make the daily fix lower or higher. And, of course, the famous quote, if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying, in one of them. Now, before I leave fraud, HSBC again caught colluding with wealthy customers in Switzerland to evade tax and only emerged because Hervé Falciani, an IT specialist, leaked millions of documents Spain and France recovered 200 million quid from 3,000 customers each that they had cheated the state out of with the help of HSBC. And the problem I think people feel, ordinary men and women in the street, or on the Clapham omnibus, as lawyers like to say, is they see this happening and no one is prosecuted. HSBC was found guilty of money laundering the Mexican drug cartels in 2012, instead of prosecution, it was allowed to pay a $1.9 billion fine. Not just too big to fail, too big to jail as well. So big frauds, largely unpunished. And let me take something that affects customers more directly, payment protection insurance, sold routinely by the financial services industry with loans and credit cards from the 1990s right up to 2010. The product was hugely profitable. It cost up to 10 times the real value of the premiums, and often the customer couldn't have made a claim anyway because of their age or other exceptions. The banks and others have paid out £20 billion in redress, and another £5 billion has been set aside for the future, but trust me, it won't be enough. And not only were they fined for mis-selling, they're now being fined for mishandling the redress process, 117 million off Lloyds, for example, in June. There was a major case called Plevin in the Supreme Court, which means they may have to reopen other cases. PPI redress is pumping £400 million a month into the economy through redress claims. It's a kind of private quantitative easing. But only one in three of those who were missold are expected to get redress. And overall, looking at the figures, the banks will probably break even, maybe make a slight profit. We often call PPI misselling like it was a kind of mistake. It wasn't. Deliberate, knowing sale of the useless product to hapless customers. And don't think this is hindsight on my part. I've been saying this long, long before the FCA stepped in. In fact, I've been booed um, on platforms when I've accused the industry of this before it became official that they'd been doing it. And what lay behind it, we know now, thanks to that Plevin case, commission. Mrs Plevin borrowed £34,000 from Paragon Financial over 10 years, and she took out PPI for five years of that. The premium for the PPI was £5,780, which she paid up front. Out of that £5,780, £4,150 was paid in commission to Paragon and the introducer LLP processing. Nearly 72% of what that poor woman paid for the, for the product was actually commission. And the balance of a mere £1,630 went to Norwich Union, who was still enough to happy and make a profit. 
And the Supreme Court found that that was fairly typical. It also said that nearly 72% was excessive and the contract was therefore null and void. That could mean hundreds of thousands more cases have to be reopened. And it also might mean that commission on uh, insurance products may have to be declared, though that's, a, that's slightly something the industry will resist. But has anyone been prosecuted? for this £20 billion fraud on maybe 10 million people? Not that I'm aware of. Now, customers may not care. They're just delighted to get a couple of thousand quid that they weren't expecting. It was a mistake. It's been found. I've been repaid. They may not realise a lot of that uh, £2,000, which is average about 1700 actually, um, is 8% interest on the premiums or penalties and interests which they wouldn't have paid. But if prosecutions are to serve a function they are to deter future criminal behaviour. And if the institutions are just fined a significant but just annoying amount, where is the deterrent? It's as if, you know, there's been a state of local burglaries, the culprit's found, his house is full of stolen gear, but he's a pillar of the community. And instead of prosecuting him, the police say, well, if anyone asks, just give them their stuff back and as a tenor, and that'll be the end of it. It's very Dixon of Doc Green justice, really, isn't it? And I say all this because this all sets a context in the public's mind about fraud. It happens, and no one does much about it. <laughs>